The inaugural lecture series is an opportunity for us to showcase the specialisms of our most recent professors, to share their knowledge and expertise with a wider community and to showcase the research taking place at the University of Bradford. Our aim is to raise awareness of the latest developments in science, engineering, healthcare, management, law and social sciences. Through their research and this lecture series, our academics help guide conversations of global significance. It is discussions like this that bolster our relevance to students and the wider community and also solidify our credibility as an institution. This evening, we celebrate the promotion of Liz Breen, Professor of Health Service Operations. I'm delighted that Liz will be presenting her inaugural address to you this evening. Liz, congratulations on achieving your professorship. I know that Liz has family members here today at the front with us. And so we give a special welcome to her husband, Connor, her daughter, Connie, and son, Christian, together with twin sister, Margaret, and Margaret's daughter, Liz's niece, Tene. We would also like to say hello to some of Liz's family and friends from Porto Ferry and other parts of Northern Ireland who are watching online. You're all very welcome. Our mission at the University of Bradford is to drive sustainable social and economic development through outstanding teaching, research and innovation. Innovation and excellence are two of our fundamental values and they also underpin Liz's work. Born into a busy home of 11 children, Liz puts her determination down to the example of her strong single stay-at-home mum, Kathleen. Sadly, Kathleen passed away in November 2021, just two days after Liz told her the university had approved her professorial case to call for references. I'm sure, Liz, that your mum would have been exceptionally proud of your achievements. At the University of Ulster, Liz carried out a BSc Honours degree in sociology, followed by a postgraduate diploma in health and social services management. From there, she travelled across the Irish Sea for her Masters in Operations Management at the Manchester Business School, part of UMIST the University of Manchester Institute of Science and Technology. Her career began with a two year research post looking at improving the pharmaceutical supply chain at the Manchester Royal Infirmary. Afterwards, Liz took on a blended role and I'll talk later about how she can turn her hand to many things. As a part time lecturer at UMIST, along with three days a week as a supply chain manager at Manchester Royal Infirmary Pharmacy, uh, that's exactly the kind of multitasking we'll talk about. The research she carried out at the pharmacy formed the basis of her PhD, and it soon became clear that academia was where Lizzie's future lay. After finishing her PhD, and uh, not long after she had her daughter Connie, 19 years ago, seems like just the other day, hey? Liz started as a lecturer in operations management at the University of Bradford School of Management now part of the Faculty of Management, Law and Social Sciences. Now at the time, the School of Management was situated off campus at Heaton Mount on M Lane. And at her interview, Liz was greeted by then Group Secretary, Jill Tor, who handed her a coffee and a plate of hot scones. Well, Liz immediately thought, this is a place I could work in. Who wouldn't? She remained in that post for 13 years, so those scones must have been very good. In 2017, Liz moved from management into the School for Pharmacy and Medical Sciences, something she describes as a huge leap of faith. Uh, but key members of staff like Professor Alison Blenkinsop and Professor Marcus Rattray made her feel very welcome and a little less terrified. There she engaged in a number of leadership roles, such as outreach lead for the school. And we're very glad you moved across. <laughs> Liz's re research focuses on improvement in healthcare service supply chains with a specific interest in the pharmaceutical supply chain. She became part of the Medicines Optimization Research Group 
and held leading roles in projects undertaking clinically focused research, responding directly to patients' needs. I mentioned excellence earlier, and Liz embodies that quality, always throwing herself into whatever opportunities come along. Liz continues to lend her expertise to other areas, for example, in writing media articles and appearing on national and international broadcast news. In 2019, she again decided to turn her hand to something new and became the director of the Digital Health Enterprise Zone. For those of you who don't know about the DES, it is an innovation facility based on campus that we are immensely proud of. DES supports teaching and research, nurtures small health companies and delivers health services to our local communities, such as an eye clinic and a physiotherapy clinic. It also hosted phase three trials of the Novavax COVID-19 vaccine and COVID-19 booster vaccine. It is a real gem and central to our mission to be a university, not just in Bradford, but for Bradford. Together with her team, Liz has built up research and professional community, connected digital health opportunity across all faculties and raised awareness of the importance of digital health activity and the benefits of greater collaboration. Liz's work has so many parallels with the long term strategy of this university, and so it gives me great pleasure to invite Professor Liz Breen to deliver her inaugural lecture, Managing the Health Ecosystem Trilemma, Providing Accessible, Safe and Sustainable Services. Uh, thank you, Rob. Um, it's very strange being here, I have to admit, and it's just amusing to see so many friendly faces. Um, within the university, we are incredibly collegiate. I already know that, but I do feel so supported by all of you tonight. So thank you all so much. It's an absolute joy to see you all tonight. So as Rob has said, what, um, what I'm going to focus on tonight is looking at the health ecosystem trilemma, focusing on safe, sustainable uh, and accessible services. Um, what I've done in my research is actually quite broad. Um, and what I've had to do for this event is bring them together, consolidate into key themes. So I've got lots of outliers, but I wanted to focus on something which seemed to be a sort of a dynamic consolidation of the research that I do. So that is what I'm going to deliver tonight. Ooh. It's not working. I think it's frozen because it's been up so long. So I have two purposes tonight, IT failure, first hurdle. Um, I'd like to focus on two different aspects. One is how uh, my research has advanced these agendas. So focusing on accessible, safe and sustainable services. But I don't want to just focus on research. For, for me, becoming a professor and the journey I've taken, it, it's much more than just research. So I wanted to fully embrace how being a professor contributes to this agenda as well. To begin, um, as I said, it's lovely to have so many of you here, but I just want to say thank you. Um, I'm not sure who we have tonight, but for those who have joined us and given up your evening for us, thank you so much for being here with me. I'm truly blessed to have all of you with me tonight. So I thought I would go back to where the study began, or my journey began, sorry, and, 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 and give you a bit of geography, I suppose, in that respect. I do have some of my friends and family anyway with me from Port of Ferry, so they should know where I'm focusing on tonight. So <laughs> this, is, this is where I come from uh, in Northern Ireland, and I don't know if many of you have visited this beautiful country, but if you haven't, you need to. It's a quick flight over from Leeds, Bradford or Manchester. But I was born, um, in this part of the world here. So if you sort of think about it, my geography is rubbish by the way, but we sort of think Bradford must be around there. It's not that far away, but a big stretch of water in between us. Um, and if we look on this image here, 
you can see that actually where I come from, Port of Ferry, has a stretch of water between it and the nearest mainland, or you have to go the whole way around this coastal route, which is absolutely spectacular. Again, must visit. Um, and um, so I, I have memories of doing this route every day to go to school. So I know there's people here who know this route the same as me. But when I went to school, I went to school uh, just about here. So I travelled every day by boat to go here. I then got a bus to this lovely part of the world. Where'd it go? Down Patrick here, which I know some people know very well. And then I got another bus from Down Patrick to Banahinch every day for seven years. So for me, that told me something about a good education, the value of education instilled in me from a very, very young age. Um, and also it was an amazing skill, which is why I went there. So my memories of that journey every day are stretches of water. Normally it's less lovely. It's more like gale force winds because I had to go on a boat every day. So I remember when I did my uh, GCSE French oral, they said, say about your journey to school, say where you live and, and what do you see? And I said, I see boats, I see water, I see BBCs. And they said, don't, don't say that because you're going to confuse and you're going to get marked down. So I said, OK, fair enough. So what I wanted to show you is this. So this shows you where I came from. And I'm just going to let you see some of the footage and then I'm going to reflect on it a little bit. So the area we're looking at at the minute is Strangford. And that's on the other side of the water. And what you can see here are boats docked and about to leave to cross over to where I come from in Port of Ferry. Now this looks amazing, doesn't it? When I sent it to someone recently, they said, that's idyllic, Liz. You know, why would you ever want to leave there? And they're right. You know, I, I think, you know, as somebody who grew up there, you take it for granted, don't you? Your home environment, how blessed you are, how idyllic it is. Um, I just see it as a bit of a slog every day going backwards and forwards to school. Um, but it is, it is absolutely amazing. And it's got this fantastic stretch of water with this really, really strong current very, very strong, very powerful, which actually is being tapped to um, provide energy to thousands of homes. So phenomenal piece of landscape. So when I look at it now, I see it more as resonating with less of the negative. Oh my goodness, I have to travel every day to school in this boat. More of that strength, that amazing place, the strength of the current, that gorgeous sort of top, that glassy top, which is perfectly serene, but actually this massive undercurrent of strength and activity. And it really reminds me of my sort of journey, you know, within um, research, you know, my journey to get to where I am. Some moments, just pure glassy tops, absolutely serene. Other parts, really bumpy, really, really choppy waters, water coming over the side of the boat, and very much an analogy as well with regards to the NHS. Sometimes amazing, sometimes choppy water, sometimes very strong and resilient, other times seems quite fractured, seems quite fragile. So Rob mentioned something about my journey earlier on, and I thought I would give you a quick tour using my Bitmojis. So this is my starting point which is why I had to go across the water to Balmahinch every day. This amazing school, very, very um, positive educational experience um, with nuns. It was part convent, so assumption grammar. So I did that. And then the plan was, like everybody else, go to university. It, was, it, was, it wasn't a, anything else other than you will go to university, which made perfect sense. But I had a bit of a blip because actually, although I did my A-levels, I didn't get the grades I wanted. So I'm a textbook case whereby things don't always go the way you want it to go. So I ended up having to resit an A-level and also take another A-level at night classes for one year to get the grades that I wanted. Got them and off I went to the University of Ulster to do a degree in sociology. And when I look back at fundamental things that shaped who I am now and my research agenda, it was my degree in sociology. It was all about people. It was all about understanding people in society, what makes them tick, what works, the fabric of society. And I really, really loved it. But it became very apparent that the next step after sociology was social work, and that wasn't for me. So I thought, okay, well, what else did I do? And um, at the time, 
uh, my twin sister and I were both doing the same degree and both qualified. She went one way, she did hotel and tourism management. I chose to do health and social services management. So we sort of parted company, same campus, but we just did different programs. That allowed me then to say, OK, I've got my degree, I've got my diploma, and now what do I do with that? And I suppose it's like all of our graduates, you know, what's next? What, how do I use it for the next step? And I actually find there was nothing for me to do at that point in time. So I ended up going into a role which allowed me to look at quality improvement, organisational development within a housing executive in Northern Ireland. Loved that job because that introduced me to a quality improvement model. So that I really, really enjoyed. That was enough for me to say I need to do more. So I applied for bursary and ended up going to UMIS on a scholarship from a research council. I used that as leverage to do a master's in operations management, which then allowed me to move into a research post. Um, I never wanted to do a PhD, funny enough. It was something that when I did the research post, which was a knowledge transfer partnership, they said, sign up for a PhD, Liz. I said, all right then. And I put it off until they said, Liz, you need now to sign up. So I did, but it was the best thing for me because I actually ended up doing a job I ended up doing my research as part of my job. I was an embedded researcher, so I was actually able to understand things, change things uh, and work with people all at the same time. So that worked incredibly well for me and I find it really, really rewarding. So I ended up staying in that role and um, this is a little picture of me in the stores department surrounded by box because I became a supply chain manager and I did that role, did some lecturing as well for Manchester University. Um, quickly realised I like analysing things, I like writing them up, not so keen on people management and working on the day-to-day -day NHS stuff. So then I applied and bless them, University of Bradford gave me a job back in 2004. I started here and I've been here ever since. I did have a slight hiatus here with my nice, oh I can't use that, my nice pharmacy sign. So in 2017 I moved over to pharmacy and um, for me that worked incredibly well because I find a home which actually really worked for me, really worked for my research. It added credibility to my research and uh, had a massive impact on my career. And I think it offered me opportunities that I hadn't actually realised existed. So therefore moving into the world of pharmacy and everyone around me uh, allowed me to get to that finale right at the top there. So for me, this has been not a linear journey, certainly a windy path seems quite easy. It had lots of stops and starts. It had moments where I just thought, what on earth am I going to do? But very much ingrained in all of that was this focus on people and systems and improvement. And that has just pervaded the whole way through my career. So in order to try and bring together research sort of focus tonight, I wanted to focus on these three areas but very much remembering that actually the target of what I do is focusing on a patient, a person at the end of the day, someone who receives, receives healthcare from us, someone who receives products, someone who receives uh, services, someone who is safe within the realm of healthcare. Um, so in doing so, it's very much looking at accessibility with regards to products, skills and services, safety with regards to products, patient, staff, services and society, and then the three different areas of sustainability, because when people tend to think about sustainability, they tend to think of green, the green environmental agenda. But actually, there are three different dimensions, social, environmental and economic. And certainly for me, all three are important when you focus on healthcare. So. I wanted to look at this not just through the lens of research, but through the lens of what a professor is and what I've done to become that professor. So uh, I asked a question um, to my daughter a few years ago um, and I said, what is a professor? I was applying for this role. I wanted to get promoted and I asked her what it was and she did the stereotypical, um, which is the middle one, which is a, a university academic uh, high rank but a person who does research. So she quoted someone who does research, their own research, not, not analysing everybody else's information, but somebody who does research. So collects data, analyses data, publishes from that. And I said, but do you not think they do more than that? And she goes, no. 
I said, all right, fair enough. So I tried to educate her. You know, 17 year olds don't want to be educated. They're right. So she was going, no, mommy. And I said, no, but there is more. And we need to appreciate that actually we are rounded individuals and certainly the University of Bradford embraces that flexibility with what we can do within these rules. When we look at our promotion criteria, it is not just research. It is very much the research, the teaching, the leadership, our engagement with community. So I, in my roles, have embraced all of that because actually that allows us to do great jobs that allows us to do great work with impact and we are rewarded for it within the promotion system as well. But when I Googled, what is a professor? This is what came up. You know, a person who affirms a faith or allegiance to something. Well, I suppose I could say I pledge allegiance to health service operations. I do that. Uh, I don't think I am the highest rank. I think Rob might trump me on that one at the minute. Um, but I am apparently the equivalent of a healthcare consultant. That's good to know. I also did this lovely test because when I asked what is a professor, it came up with this quiz. And I guess, excellent, let's do the quiz. So you'll be pleased to know, given what I'm doing tonight, I am a scholar, I am independent, I am thoughtful and I'm dependable. So there you go. I was so pleased and so relieved to see that. So what I wanted to do was to take everything that I've done and I reflected on it and I said, you know what? Being a professor, actually, there are quite a lot of roles. So I have said, look at my many hats of being a professor. So I've labeled them. And I have a researcher, an expert, an educator, a team player, representative, a nurturer and a narrator. And then you have me. So me being either one of these or a combination of all these. We shall see when I get to that, la that last slide. So the researcher, now I, I, no one who stands in this position can't say that they haven't got a strength in a key area. It could be education, it could be leadership, it could be administration. And for me, a core part of what I do is research. Now, I do other things, but I do a lot of research and I love doing it. I, uh, I have a curious mind. I like asking why and why can't we do it differently? And again, back to the daughter, drives her nuts. You know, I'll be having a conversation. I said, but have you thought of this? Have you thought of this? And I like to think of the variations in colour, not black or white, but multiple shades of grey. I like difference. I like variety. So I always ask what, I always ask why, and I always ask, you know, when, where, and, and can we think of it in different ways? So for me, the journey to that sort of curious researcher was harvested and started back at UMIST. And I know we have UMIST people in the room tonight. That for me was an amazing year, but also I had amazing people teaching me. So one of the people that taught me is sitting in the room tonight, Professor Kevin Barber. So he had a hand in making me who I am today because he taught me. Um, but I had two papers that were published that year and they were from my master's project, my master's degree. Now it's quite unusual that you got uh, an academic who supervises a project and has such faith in you that they allow you to write academic papers as well. That doesn't always happen. Um, so I was very privileged that I had Professor Barry Deal and he introduced me to a company to do my research. So that meant I had a company based project with United Utilities. He encouraged me to write these two papers, which were these two looking at the self assessment model. It's a quality improvement tool and both of them got published. But for those from the management school, you'll know that the International Journal of Production Economics is quite a high ranked journal. So that was lovely for me to get in there. I think it's still three star. Um, also that year, and, and again, I didn't actually realise that all four within the one year, I decided that I wanted to have a dabble with regards to looking at clinical governance and what it meant in the NHS, because again, I was very interested in quality improvement. And the last paper was because I had to do an audit. Um, I had to do a two week project and I chose to do an audit looking at all the medicines that were coming back from the wards into pharmacy and how much actually we were wasting. What was the efficiency that we could generate from that? What could we change with regards to this pattern of, of medicines all being thrown in the bin and wasted? And, and I ended up focusing on that and, and, and analysing it and getting a publication. So all the signs were there that I liked doing this. I was quite good at doing this. And uh, NHS management was probably not for me. It was very much research and an academic route. So 
rather than focus on what I did then, I wanted to bring you up to date. So this is a current area of mine and my colleagues will know how much work I've done looking at medicine shortages and medicines disruptions. Um, and I supervised this lovely young lady, Amelia Van Yarsen, who's now at the University of Huddersfield, and she did uh, her PhD. And I have my colleague Anne in the group tonight somewhere. I saw her earlier, Anne's at the back. So Anne uh, is from the School of Management and Julie is from Pharmacy. So the three of us made a lovely team supervising Amelia in doing a project which allowed her to look at disruptions within the pharmaceutical supply chain and aspects of resilience within the pharmaceutical supply chain. So that was a really really nice, you know, data set, a current sort of exposure into what was going on. And I also took that and used it for a symposium that we ran in 2019. But a couple of weeks ago, I went down to London to the Royal Pharmaceutical Society and basically revisited the discussions that we did back in September 2019 and brought them bang up to date. And to be fair, not much has changed between 2019 and 2023 with regards to the problems that we're having with accessing medicines. Information seemed to be one of the major contentions with regards to what we're being told, when we're being told it, how we can actually action it. And that was something that we found back in 2019 as well. We use the outputs of the 2019 event, and you can see my co-authors there, Beth is in the audience here, um, to be able to create a briefing paper that went to the Department of Health and Social Care, but we also shared those details with the Royal Pharmaceutical Society as well. So that has allowed us to say, okay, we have done a great piece of work. We have now brought it up to date and shared it, and it's got a bit more sort of airing, I suppose. Now, what do we do with it? So next steps are to actually look more at the fact that there seems to be issues with the UK reporting system for medicines. There seem to be issues with regards to what they were being told, how they could use that information. Um, and we've done some analysis with other countries and their reporting systems, but we've never got access to the UK one. So we're going to have a look at that. But to add to that, we have this issue, this issue here. Now, this is, again, a very current one. I haven't actually done any work. I'm looking at the pharmacists in the room because they might know more about this area than I do. I can see Sue smiling. Um, home care deliveries, uh, access to medicines that go into uh, a person's home, a patient's home or into care homes and any issues there. Now, I haven't seen a huge amount written on this area or published on this area. I know that there have been a couple of articles in the pharmaceutical journal recently, but I did wonder if there are errors in this, whereby patients are not getting access to their medications in home, all the good work that I've done and other people have done upstream with the manufacturers, with the distribution and the logistics, what's the point of all of that good investment if when we actually get the product into the country, it doesn't actually make its way to the patient? So again, this is an area which I felt was slightly on tap done an unexplored and that's my next port of call. Uh, I have a colleague in Leeds who's interested in seeing what more that we can do with this area. Another aspect of sustainability with medicines is the green agenda and I had a lovely student uh, Abdullah who did his PhD looking at hospital medicines waste in UK and Kuwait, looking at the practices in Kuwait, looking at the practices in the UK, seeing what both sides did um, and what we can learn from each side. It's quite interesting because there were things that were being done in Kuwait that actually were illegal but they were done as a matter of good practice because they felt that if they didn't uh, do that, they would waste money because they would waste the drugs. So you could see the, you could see the logic, you could see that sense of responsibility as in I'm throwing out a lot of money and a lot of waste. So they held it back and they used it, which actually went against their protocols. But one of the things that was lovely with regards to this paper that we created, which was more literature based paper, was it recently got quoted in the Lancet Planetary Health, which was again a testament to the work that Abdullah had done and the supervisory team that we had in place. Now sustainability is not all about the green agenda, as I mentioned earlier. Sometimes it's about business viability. Sometimes it's about reducing waste. Sometimes it's about being cost effective. So some of the work that I've done, um, including this paper, was looking at medicines recycling, looking at the cost, looking at the practices and the processes. And this one was an interesting one because it was a survey that we did and we were able to pass it out to all of the hospitals within the UK and look at the responses that come back. 
why do you recycle? Why do you uh, try and retrieve some of the costs by bringing stock back into stores, recycling them out to patients? Um, the Northern Irish response was quite nice because they were the only ones who said it's the right thing to do. The other responses were we need to save money, we need to save money for the NHS, but the Northern Irish response said actually we should be doing it. As a matter of fact, we should be doing it. It is definitely the right thing to do. So there is a lot of focus on business viability, keeping the engine running, keeping the business running with regards to sustainability. It's quiz time, guys. So I have some products on the screen and I'll be interested in your answers with regards to what they have in common. I have some sausages, I have some beer, eels, I have some medicines and I have some bags of saline. Any takers on any similarities, any reason why they'd be grouped together? No prizes, I'm sorry. It's a good night. <laughs> so you have that, you have that, you have that, and then you have the recovery mode. That is a good logic, but no. <laughs> And I will have words with you later. <laughs> so the reason I put these here is because they all are supply chains and there are others that rely heavily on returnable transit packaging. So they're all packaged into boxes or to kegs or, or to tote boxes or pallets. They need to have products to transport them and these products are ones that are put out to customers and they are pulled back in. If you don't bring them back in then you have nothing there to deliver the next batch of products going out and I'm very nerdy and I get very excited about weird and wonderful problems so I had a chat with somebody from Baxter's Healthcare and he was saying oh my goodness we're having so many problems with getting stock out nobody gives us our pallets back and, and it's causing problems with our supply chain. And I did a bit of digging and one of the big providers of, of pallets was CHEP. And when I had a chat with them, they said, yeah, they just wander. People use them for stacking things on and they don't come back and we have to buy new or they're coming back and they're, we, can't re, we can't wash them or refurbish them, they're trashed. The people from the likes of AAH and the wholesalers were saying, actually, nobody's giving us back those tote boxes because they're storing things in them. And when I said this to pharmacists, they smiled because they've done that. Um, and uh, these kegs apparently are worth a fortune with regards to sort of seals in the black market. And the top one is because when I was teaching back in management, I was teaching the Morrison students. They know a lot about groceries and production lines. And they were telling me that there were some times that the production lines had to stop because they didn't have boxes to do the transportation in. So it's quite amazing, actually. We have fundamental basic things that we need to put things in, but actually if they're not available, then we actually have to stop production and we have to stop logistics. So I thought, you know what, let's have a look at this. And I ended up doing some analysis and one of the figures that was quoted for the damage that was done to a supply chain because of this was like 140,000 in costs that it could incur because technically your customers were stealing from you. They were taking things that they hadn't paid for and they were keeping them, which meant you had to buy them. Now it goes much further than this because again, being a bit geeky, I had a look and you could apply it to pajamas in hospital. You could apply it to crutches, Zimmer frames. You could apply it to the sort of prams that you buy in or you use lease rent in airports. So actually there's quite a lot of issues whereby we have things that need to transport things and they never come back, cause inefficiencies and problems within our supply chains. So one of the other areas that I wanted to focus on was safe and I wanted to focus on safe people. Now I, again, these are areas that I, if you'd asked me five or 10 years ago, I would have said, I, I, I don't get into those. My areas, ops management and pharmaceutical supply chain. But I had lovely people who, offered the opportunity to get engaged with these. So I'm going to start with the one at the end, which is from a DBA student, Claire, who's in the room tonight. She is doing a fantastic piece of work. Um, and this is just one of the covers from a conference paper that she did in London not so long ago, looking at co-creating dignity experiences in mental health service delivery, trying to find out what it means from patients' narratives with regards to mental health experiences, but also trying to get the views of healthcare providers as well. The one in the middle, again, I have colleagues here who are from the Faculty of Health who invited me to join in uh, a supervision of a PhD student, Oladeo. Absolutely loved working on this project. It, you know, it, it's, it's 
out with my comfort zone to be involved in something like this. But again, my sociology kicked in and all day I did a fab work looking at the stressors and coping mechanisms of families and their responsibilities in China. Um, and it just amazing piece of work, some very emotive quotes coming through with regards to that work. And then the final one is the 999 call handlers. When I approached um, the Yorkshire Ambulance Service to um, inquire about this, they said that the call handlers are a voice that don't normally get heard, you know, and so I was just super impressed when we managed to get 19 interviews from this group and they told us what was happening and what was stressing them because we have a responsibility within the NHS to make sure that we have staff who are supported, who are well looked after and not stressed and not, you know, not wanting to come into work. And we have seen the value above and beyond during the, the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, with regards to the value of our staff. We knew that we rely on them and they were invaluable, but that really has shown us that as well. So I was very pleased that I was able to be involved in these projects, which produced outputs telling us more about areas that could be targeted to help these different groups. So we're moving on to the expert then. So part of uh, a professorial role in that respect, or actually any senior academic is, they are approached to be that voice, uh, that expertise, that expert opinion. So these are just two examples of where I was approached to contribute to different agendas. The first was in 2018, and that was a collaboration with uh, our head of school, Hader Zaman, and one of our colleagues, he has an honorary contract, um, from Locala. So Rachel and Hatter and I were asked to produce a case study of the UK um, supply chain and the, the role of the pharmacists within it. So that was lovely to, to contribute from the UK side with all the other countries contributing to. The next was where I was asked to contribute to this. So Prevention Web produced a series of articles looking at disaster recovery. Mine was to focus on the pharmaceutical supply chain, looking at accessibility to medicines, to products. I think I didn't actually realize at the time that it was anything to do with the United Nations. The topic was enough of a sell for me to do it, so I agreed to do it. But I was blown away when I realized it was going into a collection which had you know, United Nations disaster risk recovery involved in it. And again, it was one of those ones where by as academics, we tend to write in quite a structured way. Uh, this one was an opinion piece, so it was quite nice and quite free to be able to express myself educated, expert, but also freedom with regards to how I write it. And this one I was incredibly nervous for. I got asked to contribute to this. I'd never done anything with Parliament before. I remember sitting in my room saying, leave me alone. I need to do this. I'm on Zoom. Uh, my legs just kept bouncing. They were hitting the table. I was just so nervous. I was looking at the people coming into the room. Lord, this lady, this. And I was going, oh, I'm so out of my depth. But they wanted to talk a bit about the research I had done with regards to medicine shortages. There was a big focus on generics, what we needed to do, and they wanted my input on what research I had done. I absolutely loved it, and it was very nice getting this recognition from um, the MP at the time, Amory Morris, who is a pharmacist. Um, but I, I did find it very daunting and, and I suppose it's lovely that the university are getting involved in these sorts of things because it builds up the credibility of our research and the researchers that we have. So moving on, we have the educator. So again, a lot of what I do is teach. I have been teaching for many, many years. It's only since I came into the School of Pharmacy and Medical Sciences that I actually taught about the pharmaceutical supply chain. I'd never done it before. Taught about other things, but not that. Um, and I think it's our responsibility to be able to teach and prepare the next generation. And that's not just teaching them in the classroom. That's adding value to them as well. Um, my students get subjected to a lot of my jokes, a lot of cheesy lines. They know all about my family because I use them in my anecdotes and discussions. Um, and I also, you know, make sure that we have um, a good team with regards to our project supervision. I've, I've been very blessed with the projects that I've had at doctoral level. My students have been amazing. They've done incredibly well. I have been so pleased to have um, collaborations with all of our faculties because I've worked with all of our faculties. Uh, and that for me is very rewarding because I've learned so much, so much from my colleagues. And then continuous professional development is another area that we've worked on with regards to saying 
if we're going to make sure that we have a workforce within our healthcare who know what to do, who keep our patients safe, who keep them safe as well, who are designing our processes and systems, then we need to think about skills. And it's our responsibility, certainly within the university, to get them prepared. And that feeds back into the curriculum. That's evaluating what we do. That's making sure that we, you know, educate them above and beyond their role. So the first study in the corner was saying okay we have pharmacists who are brilliant at what they do but actually there's a lot of research out there looking at non-technical non-clinical skills so if we look at the example of the aviation industry they were saying that the highest rate of failure came from people making mistakes which weren't to do with their technical skills it was decision making it was understanding risks it was spontaneity so I wanted to have a look at management skills for pharmacists. Were they of value? Did they need them? Were they taught them? So that was quite an interesting piece because actually a lot of them said, I need to know more. I need it for my job. I'm not being taught it. What do I do next with that? I also had some amazing uh, doctoral researchers. So Zoe, um, again, Beth was my co-supervisor. Zoe did uh, a project which was a PhD by publication and it was looking at the changing role of the pharmacist. So looking at how we could support pa patients with advanced cancer, making the case for extending the role of the pharmacist, recognition of their skills, um, and also challenging the current model that is medicines optimization. So she did a fab job with that. And then we had Jazz who also highlighted the role with the, um, the pharmacists in multidisciplinary teams. What was their role? What could the other team members learn from them? One of the things that came across in that that I remember, and Julie is here as well, uh, so Julie was in the team of co-supervisors, was actually that a lot of the team were saying they looked up to the pharmacists with regards to leadership and capability. And I thought, well, that's lovely because then within the team, there was a lot of learning and transferability of skills. Others were projects that I actually think we do very well with, with regards to engaging with our industry, our business. I can see Dave in the group who's very involved with that, also was Lorraine as well. I had a very authentic research experience as a master's student, and you could argue that my PhD was as uh, an active researcher, an embedded researcher. Um, I'm very pleased that I had that opportunity and I would like students to have more of those opportunities. So I'm a massive champion for those types of, of uh, activities. The final one is a piece of work that I did with one of our colleagues here, Dr. Paul Rice, and a group of amazing people. And we were looking at digital and data skills development within Bradford Place, looking at what we had with regards to skills development, what the role of the universities, what the role of the colleges and schools were. Uh, again, very much with the view of saying we need to do more with our workforce development and what can the different parties do to support that. So I feel it's our responsibility to think about next generation and we all have different roles to play in that. So one of the more current um, aspects of continuous professional development is a conference that we ran recently. So these are some lovely pictures that came out with regards to our ambassadors who helped us. We ran a sustainability panel looking at aspects of sustainability within healthcare. We had an amazing artist. Peter, can you see your face? <laughs> So we had an amazing artist who did absolutely fantastic job capturing all of these images. And that's us doing the conference dinner. And Iman, you can see your picture up there from when you delivered your rapid fire, I think. So it was an amazing event. It went really, really well. A lot of work from my colleagues here. And also Peter was missing out of that photo because he did a sterling job supporting us. Um, but it's one of those ones whereby universities do these events. University support, we host we deliver to these agendas. And then we're moving on to the team player because we are team awesome in the School of Pharmacy and Medical Sciences. Teamwork does make the dream work. Uh, as, as Rob said earlier, I am one of 11 children. Okay, there's a lot of us. So I don't think I was ever on my own. And actually, do you know the way there's a phrase, you're never alone with a clone? Well, to be fair, pretty much had that because I have an identical twin sister. So I had a twin sister and I also had a, a very extended family. So I was never on my own. My house, our house was very busy, but I was always involved in teams. So this was one of the team sports that I played from a very early age. I played it at home. I played it for school. I played it for county and I also played it for university. And my limbs are all intact. Quite a few knocks. It's quite a lethal game. So this is Kamogi. So if you want to know more, go on YouTube later. It's lethal. Um, and when I played it, we didn't wear helmets. 
But I also have all these other teams. I have Team Morg and uh, some of my Morg colleagues are here. I also have my amazing DES team and I can see two of them in the audience tonight. I couldn't do my directorship role without them. And I also have other groups that I'm involved in. And again, large groups of people which make me feel very confident in what I do because I'm surrounded by good people who are very willing to help, who have great skill sets and make me a better person. So I just wanted to focus briefly on some of the larger team projects that I've been involved in. I hadn't done these until I came into pharmacy and I was very pleased to be invited into them uh, by the same person actually, Alison Blenkinsop, one of our professors here, invited me to join all three of these. Um, she had a huge amount of faith in me, bless her, and it worked very well. Um, so one of the first project was the ISKIMAP project, which was improving the safety and continuity of medicines management at transitions of care. Easier version is Iskimat. Um, and again, the program manager for that was Beth Violin, who's over there. So did an amazing job running this program, which is seven years in the making. Peter is also one of the leads and we're just wrapping that up. And that was a very important piece of work with regards to recognizing there were safety issues with patients leaving a hospital uh, after discharge with regards to the continuity of care, the information that followed them, and we put interventions in place to be able to support that. Um, access to medicines was a project which I looked at access to medicines at end of life, very emotive subject. Now my role in that was to uh, focus on the supply chain aspects and to supervise a, a researcher who was focusing on interviews with community pharmacy staff and interviews with wholesalers about what access do we have? Were people getting drugs if they're end of life within the community environment? It was an amazing project, again, very capably managed by Natasha Campling down in Southampton. And again, you can see that there was a policy briefing released from that. The final project is the safe use of medicines. And that is a theme which is embedded within the Yorkshire and Humber Patient Safety Research Centre. Again, Beth has a leading role in that, and the lead of this theme was Professor David Aldred, who is here tonight. So before I go to talk a bit more about the safe use of medicines theme, I want to ask you this. As a patient, what would you do with this information? If somebody told you that you had a disc protrusion, a nerve compression, chronic inflammatory condition or chronic lesions, would you know what to do with them? No, getting lots of people saying no. OK, so do you think the average patient, if you presented them with that, would know how to action it? No, I agree. So this was um, this was information that was given to me about a month ago. I'd had an MRI scan. I got this report back and it gave me really technical information. And then I had a follow up with a consultant. So when I went in, um, he said, how can I help you? I guess you can explain it to me. I guess, but I did. I guess. It was really technical and I know it says doctor in my title, but I am not a clinical doctor. And he goes, I know that. And I goes, I didn't understand it. And he goes, why? And I goes, it was just too technical. And he goes, but I give you the short version. And I goes, I get that. And then he laughed. And I and he didn't laugh in a nasty way. He laughed because he was so surprised. He was saying, I have someone who should be fairly educated in front of me and she's telling me she doesn't understand it. And I goes, I don't understand. I didn't know whether or not I stopped doing something. I started something. I took up a sport. I, I took supplements. I didn't know how to action it. I said, has no one said this to you before? And he said, no. And then that made me think, well, actually, some of the work that we have done within the safe use of medicines is to respond to that agenda. We, in a project over quite an expansive period of time, going for five years, um, we, we asked those sorts of questions. We sought information from patients and healthcare professionals with regards to what they needed information wise with regards to this topic which was deprescribing. So again I have pharmacists in the room that know much more about this so after the break when when you leave to go next door if you want to know anything about deprescribing I'm going to signpost you to some of my colleagues in the room because they will be able to have detailed conversations with you. But deprescribing is the plan process of reducing or stopping medicines. So at any one point in time, if you're on medicines and you uh, are deemed to need to reduce them um, or to up them or to come off them, then you have to have that conversation with a patient. Those conversations at the minute tend to happen within structured medication reviews and that can take place within your GP practice and pharmacists or your doctor can do that. So being very cognizant of this, 
five years ago, we set in place a big five year project, multiple work packages, going through a number of different steps, all coming together to this final work package, which we call Deploy. So Deploy is deprescribing for problematic polypharmacy in older adults with frailty in primary care. Deploy again, a bit like Eskimo, it's so much easier to say. But, you know, being in the frailty category brings its own considerations. Putting you in the frame of polypharmacy, which is five to 15 medications, uh, and then obviously just being older, all of those are a combination whereby you just might need a bit more consideration and a bit more time with your GP or your pharmacist to discuss the medication you're on. So bringing back to the information, we wanted to make sure that people felt empowered with their medicines, people felt that they could manage them themselves, but we wanted to have that conversation with them, that consultation. So as well as identifying the patients who really should have those conversation, which is a very technical tool. And um, we made sure that we had an invite that went out to the patients whereby they felt, I know what's happening. I know what's going to happen in this conversation. I don't feel as though I'm going to be anxious going into it. And then we had a tool whereby they had a record of what was changing with their, their medications. It was something portable that they could take and have the conversation with another healthcare provider. And then we followed it up with a satisfaction questionnaire. So again, it all seems quite simple, these tools, but they were just a very effective as a package. And that is a project that we finished at the end of March and we're continuing to analyze it now with regards to, did this package of tools work for the healthcare providers and the patients that were involved in this study? Safe use of medicines, again, we have to within these studies, make sure that we disseminate the findings to a wider audience. And these are just examples of some of the papers that we delivered to it. The reason why I've put them up is again, to highlight the fact that I work with huge teams. I have learned a huge amount from my team members. And actually my role within these could only have happened with the support of other colleagues. Dave Aldred is a very good example of somebody who was able to take me and mentor me and work with me during these projects. So therefore I could do the best job that I could. And for that, I'm incredibly grateful. And then I'm on to the representative. So again, we uh, take on roles that are front facing. We represent the university. We're very careful about how we represent the university. And I was asked uh, two and a half years ago um, to become the director of the Digital Health Enterprise Zone. This allowed me to be that person who would be the spokesperson for the University for Digital Health. It allowed me to liaise with my colleagues within the research environment, the businesses outside, the businesses that we had with us because we have some, but to spend a lot of time having conversations with our partners. So again, some of them are here tonight. I can see West Yorkshire Combined Authority is represented, which is lovely to see you. Yorkshire Number, Academic Health Science Network, they're here tonight as well, Nev's here. Uh, City of Research, I, there are a number of people who fit into that, but definitely Paul with regards to Bradford Teaching Hospitals. And then obviously the NHS is represented with Paul as well. So uh, it's one of those ones whereby we do you know, work and engage with our communities and we do hold rules that allow us to do that. And then my favourite, the nurturer. I'm very big in looking after people and uh, adding value to them. I like to pay it forward. I've had people teach me, invest in me, help me grow, help me to get to this place in time. And I want to make sure I do it for others. So I always pay it forward. Um, I, I've put down the growth cycle, professor, student, professor. So Kevin taught me and I turned out okay. And now I am Professor uh, Cameron Maruf, who is from the School of Management. He was my first cohort of students when I arrived at management. He is now an Associate Prof. So it, it is lovely to see that nurturing come to fruition with regards to you helping someone uh, develop their career. Um, I do really like it when our students grow and flourish, and that's through assessment or through other opportunities. Um, and I do think that it's part of my role to be that colleague, to mentor, to be that line manager, to be that friend, agony ant sounding board. Um, some of the examples whereby I've identified student talent and worked with them, provided opportunities are these. So uh, this paper was written with two of our students and again, had her as head of school and I did student projects um, and this was looking at um, patches, transdermal patches. Uh, it was a lovely piece of work and it was, that, that product was quite new to me. But again, having a pharmacist working with me made it quite easy to do. 
This is another example below of an article that was done with Amelia, my PhD student at the time. Again, I think it's really important to nurture the talent of our PhD students and, and give them the opportunity to write in different fora and to publish in different fora. And then we have sharing care sessions within the School of Pharmacy and Medical Sciences, and I am one of the three people that lead on those. We offer opportunities for staff to come in to share their views, concerns, and we, we just spend time chatting to one another, which is really nice. And then we have the orator. So I think you probably know by now that I can sort of hold my own with regards to speaking and I don't mind speaking. And the Shanahi is in Irish is uh, an, uh, somebody who is a local historian, somebody who knows what's going on, somebody who has a wealth of wisdom. And I'm not saying that's me, but I'm just saying they like to talk and people like to listen to them. I've always seen writing as threads of information coming together. I always see it as writing and weaving stories, but having that narrative, that flow. People call it the golden thread sometimes. I've always seen it coming together like that. And I think that's what the Shanahi does. They bring all of this color together in a really vibrant narrative. Um, I realized a few years ago, working with my colleague, Sarah Shifflin, that actually we can write in different ways for a wider audience. So I embraced what we call the conversation, which is a platform. It's been like an online newspaper for academics to be able to talk about what's going on within the world, translating information from quite technical stuff into non-technical stuff for a wider audience. I really enjoyed it. So I embraced it and I ended up doing a lot of media activity but again it wasn't necessarily just the fact that I could be on the TV etc it was saying people seem to understand what I'm saying breaking it down presenting it into different language and uh, people were telling me that they understood concepts better because I was doing it in that way and I thought okay well then I've done a good job I said I've been able to use my skills differently and that means that people understand in this case what's going on with the COVID-19 vaccines and they feel happier and, and then I can sleep well at night. So I really did enjoy that. And again, we have the opportunity to do all these things as academics if we choose to do so. These were two examples um, of opportunities that I had or work that I did. Uh, the first one uh, within the conversation, uh, the response just went mad. Uh, the conversation is measured in reach. So ideally, how many people may have had access to this? And Sarah and I wrote this overnight. One of us, I think I started it at night. She picked it up in the morning, went out really quickly. And it meant that we were able to push it out. And it had nearly 400,000 reads with regards to this. Everybody was really interested in the Russian vaccine. This one was an interesting one. Um, I contributed a quote to Time Magazine. I didn't actually realize it was Time Magazine at the time. I just had a, a, a reporter contact me, asked him for my opinion, I gave it, um, which is a, bit, a little bit naive of me. And then I had a look, uh, I was Googling my name for something, trying to reference, and this came up and I realized that I'd been quoted. Now I was quoted in a paragraph of Matt Hancock. I thought that's never gonna happen again. Um, but this is what I appeared in, in Time Magazine. Um, another opportunity, as I said, is the media. So I, I, funny story, I went on to Sky News to talk about the COVID-19 booster campaign. They told me that there was a bit of a lineup. Somebody was in front of me, me, Scott Robinson was coming after me, the Prime Minister of Australia. I thought, oh good. And then um, they, um, they turned around and they said, well, the guy in front of you is a little bit late. So therefore, but it'll be okay. And I got about 30 seconds in. Now, I don't know if you've done any live TV, but you, you, you stare at a black box. That's it. That's all you have. So I don't know what I look like when I'm staring at a black box. Everybody else says, sees me. I don't. And um, they said, sorry, Dr. Brain, we're going to have to cut you off. The prime minister is actually on time. I'm going so I have no idea what my face looked like. I really hunted for that clip to see if I went a distorted face. But yeah, I got kicked off for the Prime Minister and I thought, well, if I'm going to get kicked off for anyone, might as well be the Prime Minister of Australia. And this is me. I've just had the sign whereby we need to wind up. And it's very fortunate that I actually think that I am that person who is innately flexible. I was asked before about challenges of being a prof and I said, that is my challenge. I like to do lots of things. I like to wear lots of hats and I embrace the variety that comes with the role. Um, and I juggle an awful lot. Um, note, I put the Irish one on top. Um, but I, I can only do that because I'm surrounded by all these different elements. These have to be around me. I have to have 
the people I trust around me to make all of this happen. And I'm very lucky that I do. So how do we make healthcare accessible, safe and uh, sustainable? For me, this is by wearing multiple hats, not at the same time, but I think the outputs of my studies are better because I can morph into the different roles that I do. Um, I do find it's not easy all the time. There have been times I said, uh, pharmaceutical supply chain is just so difficult to research in and I wanted to go into other areas, but I'm very glad that I didn't. So a bit like my lovely Strangford Lock, there are times when it's incredibly lovely and times it's incredibly turbulent. Um, I am very adaptable. They do have a phrase, you know, if you're not living life on the edge, you know, you're, you're taking up too much room. Not really convinced about that, but I do like to challenge myself and try new things. Um, I, as I said, the people element is hugely important to me, hugely. So I am a better person and a better professor for that. So one of the slides that I had on earlier on did the NHS 75. And if you noticed what was underneath it. Come on, NHS bots. Oh, no one remembers. Yay! Yes. So when I joined in 1998 into Manchester Royal Infirmary, it was the year whereby it was the 50th anniversary of the NHS. So they were doing this 50 pence pieces. And then this year is NHS 75. So technically I have been 25 years doing NHS research or healthcare research. So I have to thank some people and I know I'm winding this up now, but these are key people that are at points in my career, they made a difference to my role. They made a difference whereby I was able to continue and become who I am today. Barry started me off very nicely back in UMIST. Kevin taught me and then became my line manager whenever he moved over and joined the University of Bradford. Alison had a huge influence in me and in bringing me into pharmacy and also lots of trust in me. Dave, I couldn't do the project that I have done without his guidance. He's been absolutely amazing. And also Professor John Bridgman, when I took on the role of DES, it was because I knew that I had his support and his guidance and that made such a difference. Also, I have to thank the funders of the three big projects that I was involved in, which is the National Institute for Health and Care Research. Team Org will always be the team of choice because they are the ones who keep me sane, they are the ones who bond together and they are the ones who make my life much easier. So I have to say a big thank you to them. And then we have this motley crew. So my family are very important to me. As I said, I come from a large family, so I like being surrounded by my family and members. And uh, some of them are here tonight, some of them are online, but I just wanted them to remember how important they are to me being able to do this. So when I yelled at them and said, don't come near me, I'm on TV, they left me alone so I could do it. And then there is no I in team. And there are two people who I wanted to have here tonight and they couldn't be here. A lot of our colleagues will know who the first one is. Gorgeous picture of him. Um, we were incredibly sad when he passed away last year. So that being the case, I just wanted to remind myself and others of how important he was in my career. He interviewed me and he was always there for me. And I'm so sad that he's not here anymore. And then my mum. Having 11 kids is, is quite a tough gig. I only have two and I find it's challenging, um, but she was very resilient, very strong. She made me who I am now and I think I take a lot of my strength and resilience from her. Thank you all for sharing this moment with me.